Good afternoon. Um, we're happy to uh, rejoin again for our uh, uh, Tea Time Technical Talks uh, program. Uh, today, we are delighted to have uh, uh, one of uh, leading uh, geotechnical engineers working in the Middle East, uh, Dr. Hazem Sarhan, who is maybe very well known to uh, all of us here. Uh, Dr. Hazem is, uh, is a very highly qualified and very highly experienced uh, geotechnical engineer with uh, many years of experience in consultancy uh, services in maritime oil and gas, uh, power, power generation, industrial and uh, LNG projects. Dr. Sarhan graduated uh, from Cairo University, then he got his PhD from Houston University in the United States. And uh, he worked in uh, uh, several projects related to oil and gas in leading companies uh, all over the world, particularly in the in the Middle East for the for the uh, for the last uh, few years. Uh, of course, Dr. Hazim is also an expert on uh, uh, pile testing and pile quality control testing, as he represents also uh, PDI uh, in the Middle East uh, uh, usually. So uh, today, Dr. Hazim is uh, going to talk about a very interesting and important topic, which is related to managing risks in deep foundations, uh, typically through uh, uh, proper testing and interpretation. So Dr. Hazim, uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for the kind introduction. And good morning or good evening, uh, uh, joiners for the webinar, wherever you're located. So the title of today's presentation is uh, Managing Risks in Deep Foundation. So uh, this topic uh, talks about the different uh, methods that are available in the market that enable us to quantify and manage the risk of the construction in deep foundations. So we're going to go through, uh, you know, uh, just a quick uh, question and answer about why do we test? What is the need to have any testing done on deep foundations? And then we're going to briefly touch uh, base on the low uh, strain integrity test, one of the widely available tests in the market, as well as the cross-hole sonic plugging. And then we're going to segue into one of the newer methods in the market, that is the thermal integrity profiling that's also uh, used to assess the integrity and um, the quality of the deep foundations. So why, uh, I mean, why do we, what is the need for testing? I mean, we need to be able to uh, a certain that the deep foundation that is installed inside the ground uh, can satisfy both uh, having a good structural integrity as well as a good bearing capacity. Because we as uh, designers, contractors, owners, stakeholders cannot afford failures. Uh, these are just examples of uh, case histories in which the construction operation was not as per uh, intended for the design. So why we test? So we want to make sure that the structural integrity of the pile is maintained. And for this uh, goal, we have the low strain integrity testing, which we're going to talk about, the cross hole sonic plugging, which is another widely used method in the market. We have the caliper, various calipers, and we also have the thermal integrity profiling, which is going to be the second half of this presentation. To ascertain the geotechnical capacity, we all, I mean, it's widely known to use a static load testing or a bi directional load testing or a dynamic load testing. So uh, the presentation, I mean, there's uh, several studies that show that chats, uh, the percentage of chats with anomalies, one in 2005 and one in 2012, both of them concluded, reached about the same conclusion, about 37, 38% of shafts contain anomalies distributed. I mean, they differed a little bit about where's the uh, anomaly located, but both of them showed that most of it either in the top 
uh, two diameters or the bottom third of one or two diameters of uh, the pipe. So and the less percentage is within the middle, which is about 10%. So these kind of studies show, show us that um, although uh, maybe we can strive to have a good quality uh, construction methods, invariably there, there will be some kind of uh, unforeseen uh, factors, uh, maybe construct, uh, construction methods that are not maybe suitable for the specific site or any unforeseen uh, event can affect the construction of the uh, lead foundation. So lead foundation is a peculiar structural element in which after it's finished, you don't really see it. It's not like a structural column you see in the building and you can immediately uh, know if something is okay or not okay with the, with the column or slab or the, the drill shaft is embedded within the ground. So you have to have a method to assist the, the stakeholder to make sure that what is installed inside the ground is the same as it is intended in relation to the structural capacity and the geotechnical capacity. So the low strain integrity test is, uh, as described in ASTM D5882, is a, a method that, uh, you know, uses, uh, it finds major defects. It assesses the quality of uh, the drill shaft. And by these, um, by them, we can reduce the risk. So this method, uh, usually finds major defects. It cannot find smaller, maybe like more than 20, 25% of the cross-section if you have a problem. This method can give you an indication that something is wrong. And uh, once we identify that there is a problem, we can then take measures about how to address this problem and reduce the risk. So in a, in a, in a site, you can have, uh, uh, many piles that is are exposed and uh, it, it may be different from each project or each client whether how many piles they would like to test it also comes to the uh, specifications or regulations within a specific area should we test one percent two percent hundred percent so it is uh, in the end made as as per the specifier or the consultant and following the regulations, or it can be a client request that may be sometimes because it's a relatively quick and easy and cheap method to do, relatively cheap to test 100% of the piles using this method. So the, again, the prime function of the uh, pile integrity test is to locate major defects. Yeah, so evaluate questionable chains. It can easily test many piles uh, within one day. So it's a good method for quality assurance. There is no advanced selection required. So you may not need to have uh, a pre-selected or predefined test, uh, pile test that you like, like a pile look test. You don't need to determine which one is going to be tested. So it can also be good or useful for forensic purposes. So if we suspect something went wrong, during the construction, this method can be suitable. The testing, uh, in testing equipment usually involves a main unit to, to record the, the test as it's being done in the field. It involves hammers uh, of different sizes. It can be employed to different size shafts. Uh, within the unit, you can have, uh, of course, the, the memory to, to store the data and uh, an accelerometer that records the impact uh, stress wave as well as the reflection through the, as it travels down and reflects up the shaft. So if you have a small handheld hammer, you strike the, the shaft with the handheld hammer, you create the stress wave that travels down the shaft and is then reflected from the shaft toe upwards. And this is then recorded by the accelerometer. This is usually handheld by the tester, as you see in the picture here, and he's seeing the input signals and the recorded reflected signals in, in the main unit. So in case you have a pile that uh, has no problems, so 
at time equals zero, you're going to be, the, the accelerant is going to reflect the input signal. Then the stress wave travels down a pile uh, of uh, length L and will meet the toe at the time of L over C if C is the wave speed. And then it's going to be, this stress wave is going to be reflected upwards again and recorded by the accelerometer at the time equal to L over C. So in case you have a good pile, there's no problems with it. This is a typical signal of what a typical pile can look like without problems. You have an input signal, relatively uneventful uh, passage of the signal through the pile, and then a reflected signal from the toe at uh, two LOVC. Now, in case there is a defect, in the pile, what happens is that some of the input stress wave is going to be reflected at the defect back up again. So, at say you have a defect at uh, distance x from the uh, pile top. So, at time x will see this portion of the stress wave is going to be reflected upwards, and then you're going to see it recorded at your uh, with the accelerometer at two x over c at the time two x over c. And then the rest of the stress wave travels down the pile, reflects back from the pile to upwards, and you can then see the toe reflection at two elements. And that is if a good portion of the stress wave does reach the toe. If the defect is not a complete uh, disjoint, then sometimes you may not even see the toe reflection. And uh, uh, this is what uh, a signal looks like if you have a problem uh, in the shaft. Like at, at this location, it is clear that you have another reflection, maybe midway at uh, ten, say 10 meters. Uh, that indicates that there's a major thing within this, with this shaft and warrants a further um, assessment. So if you do, for example, a coring, decide to do a coring it, it, in this particular case, it showed that at that location, 35 feet or 10 meters, that you had a, a mixture of sand, cement, and gravel. So you don't have uh, the, the expected uh, high strength content. So there's a defect and then there's a, an inclusion or something that is mixed with the, with the concrete. Now, if you... Uh, for a pile that's going to, I mean, we're going to show some examples. For this is an example of a good pile again. And this is an example of a, a pile that is tested with some questionable uh, measurements around L over equals uh, about 15, 15 meters. So uh, it looks like a bad pile and so this, this method is used to determine whether we have a good shaft or if there's a major defect. This method is good, quick and easy to determine that. Uh, you, can, you can see the tester here using different sizes of, of hammers. Uh, but at the end, you see a toe reflection as well. So it's not completely bad, but there's something that needs to be investigated at this, at this level. So preparation. Uh, of the pile top. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, this is an ideal case. The pile is clean, it's at waste level, the area is dry around it. So this is, maybe you can call this is a very, maybe a good site for, for doing this test. Usually, the, sometimes the real conditions on site are not that ideal. So, but at that time, what you need to do to prepare the pile top is you remove the loose contaminated material or fractured concrete from the core. You cut the rebar down to the minimum length so it doesn't create any resonance or vibrations. And then you grind the flat spots for the hammer impact and where you need to attach the accelerometer. So uh, this is uh, how you prepare the, the, the uh, the pile for doing the test. And of course, when we do the measurements, sometimes you need to use some data enhancements, which can assist you uh, in the data acquisition process. So it's always 
good to collect multiple blows while you are on site because the more data you collect, the better chances you're going to be having in relation to the interpretation of the data. And it's when you have more than one uh, test at the same time, you can average out random thoughts and, and noise. Uh, the best, uh, and you can also uh, do some enhancements to reduce the noise and enhance the resolution for the signal processing. So if we have, if we look at some case studies, uh, this is a file integrity test signal. It indicates there is a defect around this location, around maybe four meters. And this is confirmed by CORE. So again, if you have, we look at the CORE, you see that there is a fractured, broken concrete. So there is a confirmation that there's a problem in this, uh, this location. Uh, so a failed static load test, another example, the reaction file looked okay, but the test file uh, looked to have a defect around um, about this, this area. And by doing, again, a decoring, you have determined that there's contaminated concrete, silt, and sand around this, this area. So uh, then you see the total reflection. So on this particular shaft was tested using PIP because the static load test did not fulfill uh, the, the proof load test. It, it, it failed for less than half of the required, and this was the reason. So the conclusions about, uh, in summary, the conclusion that uh, interpretation you know, looks for a good data. You have to be have consistent, reasonable data similarity or differences for different files. It uh, it can look for rapidly changing features in data, which is can be attributed to structural uh, effects. If there is a slow change in features, usually it is more soil related. Uh, you, you look usually look for a toe signal. You, if you don't have a toe signal. That means that the, the stress wave did not reach the toe and can be a problem. It can also, the shaft uniformity can play a role in the interpretation if irregular shafts can have very multiple reflections and make the interpretation quite challenging. Uh, you, it gives you indications of the major defects and uh, it's always a good idea to compare the soil profile with the installation records. So if you have a, a change in soil uh, layers and you at that same location, uh, you see something questionable. So maybe the construction method did not take into account these like maybe soil is loose soil, it was not properly um, retained, um, whether using a bentonite or a casing method, it may not have been suitable and you can have maybe created a problem and, and at this location. So always comparing the soil data and selection records can give you some background information that can be useful in the analysis and interpretation. So, uh, so the integrity testing method using this file integrity testing uh, looks for major defects. It can uh, be useful for general interpretations, but if it, you're going to read too much detail into the, the signal, it may not be as much useful. So it may you may read more into what the data really tells you. So the classification, uh, I mean, this is uh, recommendations. If you have a double A good pile, you have a clear no response, no obvious defects, then it can mean a sound shaft. If you don't have a major defect to a depth of X, no indication of defects, but no apparent to response. You can give it a classification of A, B, or till X. If there is a probable flow at the depth of X, that uh, can indicate early impedance decrease uh, if, and, and the toe uh, response is apparent, then perhaps you may need to perform additional quantitative analysis. Uh, if there is a probability, there's a clear identification of a serious defect at the depth X, there's a probable defect no to response, so we need to retest or do other tests or reduce the capacity or replace even replace the pile. 
And if you have a poor top a pile top quality or a complex geometry, and so the data may not be useful. So you can it can be an inconclusive results. Uh, some studies suggest uh, limit the limitations. Some some studies suggest that there is a limitation of uh, 30 of L over D, L is the length and D is the diameter, but this is only a rule of thumb. But in reality, it can de be dependent on the source strength, pile uniformity, actual diameter and length. And the equipment noise and resolution can often see more farther than 30 L over D. So if you have highly non-uniform piles, it will be difficult to interpret. If there are cracks or mechanical joints, it will block the waves. It will be also difficult to interpret. If it, if you have small defects, it will be typically quite uh, difficult to find. Uh, defects near the top also can be difficult to detect, uh, and cannot you know you cannot locate where the defect is within the the pile quadrant. So you don't know if it's in the north, the south, the east, the west. You just know the depth. Uh, so these can be the limitations. In conclusion, it's a it's fast and inexpensive method. The equipment is mobile. Uh, it requires minimum site support. So the, the tester can do his own preparation. You can test many or even all the piles on site in one day. You don't need advanced planning. Uh, the site uh, pile surface preparation is minimal. It can only find major defects, cannot locate defects in the cross section can have some potential length limitation if the pile uh, length over D ratio is, is large, then it may not penetrate to the full depth. Uh, if you have very long room from piles or cracks or joints, it will be also difficult to interpret. So if we then move to this, the second method we want to talk about today, which is the cross hole sonic logging, which is another uh, widely used application to test the quality of drill shafts as in, as described in the ASTM D6760. Again, in drill shafts, uh, sometimes they have little or no redundancy. So we need to make sure about the integrity of each shaft and it's critical. So sometimes you have uh, bridge foundations that have only one drill shaft under it. So if this your old shaft is not, you're really not sure about the quality and there's no redundancy, it can be a problem. So it is critical for us to determine the quality of uh, large diameter drill shafts, especially in, in cases when there is no redundancy. So the test procedure is, you, is described as you have uh, access tubes, which is usually installed every 300 millimeters of shaft diameter, you have one, Tube. So if you have one meter diameter, you typically put four access tubes. You fill the access tubes after the installation with water to minimize any debonding between the, the, uh, the tube and the concrete because of the hydration temperature. You then lower the uh, transmitter probes and receivers within the access tubes, and then you start collecting, pulling the, the two probes upwards and then collecting the data as you pull the, two, the probes upwards. And then you can look at the cross sections. So you lower them in one, uh, one tube and you have the receiver in one in the other, and you can test this section. And then you can repeat the test for all the possible combinations. If you have four tubes, and then you can have six possible combinations. And in, uh, in newer versions of the the uh, the testing equipment uh, you can you can lower four probes each of them act, acts as both transmitter and receiver and you can then extract them at the same time and then you can have all six uh, cross sections done in one test compared to the older versions of the equipment in which you had to do repeat the test six times so what the test is the transmitter emits a signal which is then read by the receiver and there's a transit time. And if you uh, color code the upper portion of the signal and then you, you combine all the signals together in what we call a waterfall diagram, 
it then becomes quite intuitive to interpret. So if you have a consistent signal, you don't have any, uh, any late arrivals, and then in, in a specific location, you, you have a loss of signal, and then a continuation, this becomes uh, the loss of the signal means that the receiver didn't receive the transmitted signal, which can be interpreted as a defect, it can be a inclusion, uh, necking, or something that is blocking the path of the uh, of the signal. So if you have a shaft and you have the enforcement cage and you have the cross hole logging tubes uh, and you have the different cross sections and hypothetically speaking, you have a defect that is in this case, it's quite a big um, uh, defect. And you look into the defect that it's crossing the paths of uh, the, set, the signal that is coming from one to four, or from two to four, or from three to four. But in the other, uh, in the other transects, you don't. It's not uh, crossing the path, so you don't expect to see. The signal to see that. So the anomaly is directly in the path in the cross sections one, four, two, four, and three, four. So it can easily detect, but not in the other cross sections. At the same time, if the anomaly is located outside the rebar cage in the cover, the chances are that this method may not detect this anomaly because uh, it can only see within the rebar cage. So the cross section of the rebar cage, you have the tubes uh, fixed at these locations, and the transmitter and receiver sees inside the core of the shaft. So this is one of the uh, uh, you know situations in which this test method cannot see the anomaly that is that is outside. This is a typical uh, testing method in which, uh, for example, we have a good signal if you have a, a bad signal or reduced signal strength or delayed first arrival time because of a low, slow wave speed. So this is what it looks like. If you have a reduced signal strength uh, and a delay in the first arrival time can indicate a defect. And usually when you do querying, it, it, it confirms the, the problem. So, uh, uh, Historical rating guidelines, if you have a first arrival time less than 10% and energy, energy reduction less than six decibels, then you have a good satisfactory. And then you go through the different categories. You have a questionable, if you have first arrival between uh, 11 and 20 and energy reduction less than nine, and then the poor flaw and then the poor defect if you have uh, first arrival more than 31% and then a reduction more than 12 decibels. If you put it in a graph format, this is the quadrants in which you have a good, acceptable. Uh, this is the CSL rating guidelines by DFI. Uh, so category A is acceptable. So you have the first arrival delay and the reduction in energy. And the yellow categories is, is uh, conditionally acceptable, and category C is highly abnormal. So this is in a graphical format, maybe it can be easier for the interpretation. So it is category, category A, the data is within normal ranges. There's no additional assessment needed. If it's within category B, uh, we have to uh, kind of rule out uh, the problems. So we try to rule out uh, debonding between the access tubes and the concrete. So may, sometimes we flood the pile and wait 30 minutes and retest. If the problem disappears, then uh, it can be because of that. If the concrete mix has a retarders, so it takes a long time to the concrete to harden, maybe you need to wait longer times. Uh, Sometimes you can do tomography analysis to assess the affected area in, in a more detail. Uh, you can consider the number of affected profiles, the depth and vertical extent of affected zone severity, and then you can discuss with the designer how this affects the performance of the shaft. Uh, you can, if it's visually uh, accessible, you can excavate to have visual 
if it's near the ground surface, or you can maybe perform complementary tests, maybe using low strain or high strain tests to see if this the performance is satisfactory. If it's a category C, it's high abnormal CSL result, then it's recommended to really understand what's, what is the problem, you pour drill to further define the extents and the nature of the anomaly. Uh, then you can con you can uh, do compressive test tra uh, strength tests on the concrete core samples, and if uh, required, you can do uh, pressure routing only even replace uh, the pipe. So uh, case histories in this is a, a case histories that shows uh, the effect of uh, concrete hardening. So some specifications. Uh, require that you wait at least three or four days. Some specifications uh, require even longer time, seven days. And this can show you a clear example by the time, you know, if you test uh, day one, day two, or day three, the effects on an apparent anomaly is then automatically rectified because at the time the concrete was still not hard enough. Uh, another example, if you have this close, shows a clear uh, example of a, a defect around the top third of the shafts. In this particular case, uh, there's uh, water problems uh, during the installation. So it may have caused some washout of the cement and create the, created these, uh, these problems. Uh, and it could be due also to a, a tremor problem. It was not the tremor of the installation was not uh, properly done. And uh, by uh, doing the core samples, it confirmed the existence of anomalies and the shaft was rejected. Another example in which uh, you can have, uh, you, we see there is a problem towards the bottom. Uh, bottom of the shaft, and also the core confirmed that there is minimum or no recovery at the shaft bottom. So then it becomes up to the designer or the owner or the owner's representative to determine uh, whether to accept or reject uh, the shaft based on these results. There is another test that was done to just to demonstrate the example when we had the anomaly along the cover or the concrete, uh, you know, on the outside of the cage. And you did the test and the CSL did not see a, this anomaly. So because it's outside the rebar cage, so it did not see um, this anomaly. And this one shows a, a debonding issue. So this is the initial test. And then after flooding the top shaft and waiting 30 minutes, you do the, the test again and the, the problem is solved. So it's, it was clearly a debugging issue. There can be other examples in which uh, the design is sometimes impractical, or if you have a very heavy reinforcement, which is, uh, is increasing the likelihood of having honeycombs and uh, you know concrete will not flow easily in the voids and even if you have a high workable concrete, you still have a high probability of having problems in, in these situations. So uh, tomography is another tool that we can employ that can give us a 3D view of the defect and, uh, and location. So it can, uh, it's another tool that will uh, give the designer, I mean, the, the, the testing, uh, the testing agency can, can, can offer this service and do the tomography and then they give it to the designer and, and then they can discuss what can be done with the shaft. Maybe it's acceptable, maybe that it can determine that there's enough redundancy in the whole of the uh, designed uh, foundations or they can determine that something needs to be done to rectify the problem. So to summarize the advantages and limitations of this method, uh, it's uh, advantages, it's not sensitive a, to the surrounding soil or the pile length over D ratio. So it can go down the tube as long as you have access, uh, as long as you can also pull it out. 
It can check the concrete inside the gate, the cage. It can give us information about the depth and the quadrants in which the defect is located. The interpretation is quite intuitive and easy to interpret. If you see a, a white a location, there's no signal, and it's, it automatically gives you an indication there's a problem. Uh, again, when the contractors, you, you see that you have installed tubes that is going to be tested later, it, it inspires better construction. And you can have advanced uh, analysis uh, using tomography that allows the interpretation to be more specific and allows the designer and the stakeholder to make more informed decisions about what to do if there's a problem. Uh, limitations, you have to wait three to five days in order to do the test, sometimes longer. Access tubes are required. Uh, usually steel is preferred to PVC because it has uh, less problems with uh, bonding issues. It can also evaluate problems outside the cage. Uh, if you have a small defect near the tube, it may appear larger than necessary. Uh, again, debonding and bleeding uh, issues can lead to delays. And maybe uh, if it's not uh, having the right interpretation, you can end up doing coring and maybe uh, more expenses. Now, this brings us to the uh, third method we want to discuss today, which is the thermal integrity profiling as described in ASTM B7949. Mm -hmm. the, ter the thermal integrity is the one of the newer methods in the market. It measures the elevated, when you pour the concrete, it measures the elevated temperature during the hydration process. And from this measurement, you can then correlate it to the pile integrity. So the temperature during curing is directly correlated to the concrete quality, volume, and radius. And the variance of temperature between different measuring points uh, can indicate cage misalignments or cover issues, which is one of the, it's the only method that can give you indications if there's a cage misalignment or there's a, there's a um, less than required cover. So the method involves uh, I mean, you have to uh, calculate the concrete volume, which then allows you to, uh, the temperature to be converted to a radius. The method involves uh, putting a thermal wire along the inside of the reinforcement. Also at the same, uh, like every 300 millimeter of shot down to you put wire seals similar to the access tubes of the CSI. Mm -hmm. So the thermal integrity profiling evaluates the concrete inside and outside the rebar cage. Uh, it covers uh, both concrete and cage misalignments. The integrity can be assessed much quicker compared to the CSL. So as early as 12 hours after placement, you can have an indication about what's the status of the pile. It is, uh, once you have made that determination, then it allows the testing and the contractor and the owner both to allow construction to progress much faster because we can make a faster determination about the quality. Uh, so again, if you accumulate all these time savings, uh, maybe you can translate weeks uh, into project schedule, which can be quite valuable to the, uh, every all stakeholders. Uh, the method details of procedures are covered under B7949. Uh, the thermal wire are threaded inside the rebar cage uh, every, uh, and it's put every 300 millimeters and uh, attached to the reinforcement on the inside. Usually it needs to not to be on, on the inside inside, but maybe on the side of the reinforcement cage because if you have a trolley or if you have something that is being uh, thrown down the tube, the, the shaft, it doesn't get in direct contact with the thermal wire. The applications uh, can basically cover all uh, deep foundation applications from drum shafts to overcast and place piles to continuous pipe other piles to micro piles to even secret piles and diaphragms. The thermal integrity, this is how it looks like after its installation. 
all wires connect to a data logger, tap, and then there's one uh, aggregator, uh, tap aggregator that, uh, um, that corresponds with the old data loggers and then communicates with the main unit or if the main unit is not on site, sends the data over the cloud to the engineering office for the interpretation. So to explain it a bit more, the during the hydration process, the concrete is uh, emitting uh, heat into the environment into the, into the soil. So if you look, if you uh, if you plot the temperature variation along the depth of the shaft during the hydration process, you can have uh, more uh, temperature. Uh, dissipation around the top and the bottom of the shaft. So you have temperature profile increasing until in, in the along the shaft it becomes the constant and then it tapers off a little bit towards the shaft bottom. Uh, and if you look at it from a 3D perspective, so if you have, if you imagine that the heat that is being emitted from the shaft takes the shape of the, the this uh, this this shape conical shape and if you imagine that the 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 reinforcement cage is a cylinder it's going to intersect uh, this heat signature at the yellow points so these yellow points represent because this is where we put the the thermal sensors measuring the heat of hydration up at the uh, edge. So inside is, is hotter and then the uh, temperature reduces as we go away from the center. Mm -hmm. So if the uh, cage is perfectly aligned, we expect that the measurements on these two points to be the same. So if you look at the thermal readings uh, and, and all the wires are identical, the thermal wire measure, the temperature measurements are identical, meaning that the cage is located at the theoretical location in comparison to the heat signal that is being dissipated. Now imagine that you have a reinforced cage that is not located at the center, but is uh, misaligned. There's a cage misalignment. What happens is that the point at the cage that is closer to the center is going to, or this red dot is going to measure higher temperature compared to the corresponding point uh, at the diametrically opposite location, the blue dot, which is closer to the surface. So it's, it is on this surface measures a lower temperature. So if you look at the blue ribbon versus the red one, red measures higher temperature compared to the blue. So this one gives you an immediate indication that there's a cage misalignment. If you have an anomaly that is closer to one of the wires, so the heat uh, measurements at that location is going to be uh, colder compared to the another wire that is completely surrounded with concrete. So this dip in temperature at a specific location, at a specific depth, is going to indicate that we have a problem at that location in relation to uh, a defect, uh, necking or soil inclusion, which is not uh, emitting the same heat signature or amount of heat that is similar to the other points along the shaft. So even in, in, in W1.1, W1, you can still see a little bit a smaller dip, but not in, that's not the same as the one that is very close to the uh, defect. So what does a so, so this signature gives us two indications. We have a defect at that location. And when you see a separation between the two signals along the shaft left, this means that there's a cage misalignment. So it gives us a bit more information compared to the previous methods that we have discussed. So if you compare, uh, so. So if you compare um, the heat signals at different timestamps, 
say we look at the uh, time stamp at one hour, four and a half hours, eight hours, and 11, 18 hours. You see that the uh, it's relatively flat and that all the heat signatures is um, a little bit aligned. Maybe there's, there's a little bit misalignment towards the lower sh shaft here. So overall, you can see that there's uh, after eight hours, 18 hours, you can see that there's no problem with this shaft. This allowed you to contrast with this signature. After two hours, you can see at a depth of 35 feet, there's something not looking right in the form of a necking. And as time goes by, four and a half hours, this becomes more pronounced. And eight hours, definitely there's something wrong. And 18 hours, this, this is how the signature looks. So uh, pretty quickly, this method can tell me that there's something wrong in this shot. So can uh, give an early warning that something needs to be done. In the thermal integrity, if you look at prior to, uh, if, if you look before poor completion and at peak temperature, so the anomaly effect is pronounced or it's uh, the most evident at the peak temperature. So that's the timestamp at which you would like to do the interpretation of the results. Because at, uh, prior to the poor completion, it's not really, yeah. you know, you cannot say uh, with the great confidence what is the situation. But at peak temperature, it is clear that there's something wrong with this time, uh, with this heat step. Now, if you have an accurate volume, this is critical for the analysis. So if you have field logs, concrete logs, construction records, this is going to be quite important to calculate the radius based on the volume input over a given log. The average temperature of all wires uh, at a specific time step and, and the R average over T average equals the temperature to radius multiplied. Now, if we, want, if we want to look at criteria similar to the CSL criteria and the PIT criteria that we discussed before, in, in this case, if we have uh, recommendations about the TIP criteria, if you have uh, less than 6% radius reduction and the cover criteria is met, then we can say that this shaft is satisfactory. If you have a radius reduction more than 6% 6, 6 or cover criteria is not met, then this requires a further evaluation. The typical you know, cover requirements as per different codes uh, also depends on application. If you are in an aggressive environment, you typically uh, want to increase the concrete cover. And uh, acceptance criteria have been I discussed in one of the DFI, DFI's annual conferences and in more details in these, in these papers. If we can, if you want to run through quick case histories, uh, this particular example uh, demonstrates the, how this method can be useful in, in relation to time savings. In this particular case, there's a project with 350 shafts. Uh, I think the project was in South Carolina, and the contractor agreed to a very aggressive time schedule in which he's going to install all 350 shots in six weeks. And uh, there was a small area he's working going to work on. There was a there was a concern about the ground water table, and they wanted to have a very accelerated construction schedule. So the agreement was that. All shafts will have to be tested using thermal because it's, it, it is one of the method. It is the method that allows a quick assessment of the uh, of the status. So you don't have to wait uh, three five days and then for the report to be done seven even more days for you to understand what's happening. So diameters range from one point two to two point four. Temporary casing eight meters. The groundwater table was present at one point two meters below the top. The final top. 
and all shafts were tip tested. So the first shaft indicated that shot number one there's indicated there's a problem around four feet to 1.3 meters. And uh, when shaft number two was tested, it was apparent that this problem also existed. Shaft number three, still the same problem. And shaft number four, you had also a similar problem. So <laughs> as well as shaft, so at this stage, there was a concern and uh, yeah, there was uh, there some calls you know, were, were done and that was the uh, findings and uh, it confirmed that there is a problem at that location and uh, the the concern about the groundwater table was confirmed that it may not was the construction method was not perhaps uh, suited for that uh, site condition and then it was adjusted and then the construction completed and this problem was avoided. Just to compare, uh, this is the amount of shafts that was test that was installed on site when the shafts, uh, when the when the thermal integrity identified there's a problem. So you had six shafts in total out of 350. And then uh, <clears throat> we knew that there's something wrong in the construction. <clears throat> now, if you compare this with the crosshold sonic. This is how much, how many shafts, because of the accelerated schedule, would have been installed before anybody would have known there's something wrong in the shafts. And this is how many shafts would have been installed before you received the report, because it takes a few more days to produce a report. So maybe nearly, maybe I don't know, 40, close to 40% of the shafts would have been installed before realizing that you had a problem. So this, uh, this example demonstrates the, the strength of the method if you compare this number of shafts, we had an early detection um, and you had uh, something that needs to be rectified in the installation process and then allowed uh, the contractor to adjust and complete the, the construction operation with minimal uh, disruption and uh, remediation of the problem compared to if you had to uh, contend with problems in all these shafts because there was something being repeated that you're not aware of. So the summary that 100% of the shafts were tested by thermal integrity and uh, the tip identified six shafts with defects in the upper one and a half meters. Uh, groundwater table at approximately 1.2 meter below the top of the shaft was probably the cause causing washing out of the concrete when the casing is pulled. Uh, because the current revealed and confirmed that you had voids in all test shafts as identified by thermal integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, the construction techniques were then modified to uh, avoid this problem. And the early detection saved a considerable uh, cost and delays for the project. Example number two, it's a test uh, for a uh, shaft in a bridge in Washington state. Uh, it was a huge diameter, three meters, and also the shaft length was very high because uh, there was uh, little to no redundancy for the shafts under the, the, the piers. So because of the large diameter, you had 10 wires installed per shaft. Uh, so the, Data started during the pouring and the peak temperature reached for after 40 hours compared to a typical 16 to 18 hours for smaller shafts because of the shaft uh, was, was big. So the analysis of the uh, of the measurements indicated there was something wrong around uh, 30 meters or 90 feet downstream. And the problem is if you uh, look at the cage mm -hmm. that this uh, you had some exposure to the enforcement so it's not only a, and the problem was confined to the, to the cover it was also exposing the, uh, the reinforcement so 
after the interpretation, uh, it, it looked like thermal wires seven, eight, and nine were closer to the to the problem. And if you uh, plot the three D of the of the shaft and reinforcement, you can see clearly that you had an exposure at this depth. Clearly, a problem that the owner wanted to verify. So they ordered to have coring locations uh, to determine the extent of the problem. And because they thought the contract was in fault, they forced them to do uh, you know, more cores than maybe we would typically do. And the coring close to wires seven and eight uh, confirmed the test results. And you know, based on these, uh, based on this result, it was hydro pressure and routing was performed to rectify the problem. Another case history, just to give an example about the cost comparison between uh, the well-established crosshold solid logging and the thermal integrity test. So the, the cost can be, uh, there's several components. There's the material cost and there's the engineering cost and the, the time that uh, you have the results established for one method versus the other. I'm not going to maybe go in details, but as a summary, uh, this was also included in one, of the, in, one, in one paper. So the material cost, if you compare the tubes, uh, the caps, the labor to install, the post grounding, you come up with a 31,000 compared to having the same material cost for the thermal, which was about uh, half cost. Then the engineer cost, the, the CSL, you have to have seven visits on site, mm -hmm. and 10 individual tests. And if you compare this to the, the tip, you only have to visit the site once to make the installation. And then uh, during the, the concreting, you, you, you did not need to go to the site. Uh, this was recorded automatically using the data logger, sent to the, crowd, to the cloud and then downloaded by the engineer for the analysis. So you saved the time, the traveling time. Uh, so if you compare the total cost, which is comprised of the material and the engineering, you get about half uh, the cost for the term. So, uh, in relation also to the time, CSL gives you the results after seven days. Thermal gives you the results after 20 years. So talking about the advantages, you have the ability to analyze the full cost section, which is something for, uh, specific for this testing method. And uh, when we compared it with the other testing methods, it was not, uh, the CSL can only see inside the rebar cage. And the tip can also only see very large, like 20% or more defects. Uh, this is the only method also that can resolve the case with huge misalignments and the minimum cover. It is insensitive to bonding and leave water. Uh, through all the tests that has been done, there is no false positives. Uh, the access tubes are eliminated. Uh, you don't have any post construction routing. You have the full temperature record over time, and you have faster results about between 12 to 48 hours. And you can have virtual data collection, which was uh, very good, especially during the restrictions and uh, during the uh, travel restrictions of the pre previous years. Uh, the engineers didn't have to travel and so they could collect the data uh, remotely. Limitations, you have to pre-plan to install the wires. Uh, the test can only be done during the curing. So if you miss that window, you don't collect the data. And the concrete volumes needed to be uh, collected for quantitative interpretation. And I hope I am uh, within the time limitations. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, be happy to answer mm -hmm. any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hazim. It's a very comprehensive and uh, really very informative uh, um, presentation on the uh, many of the important associated risks that we usually face uh, in, in, in our applications. And uh, for this, I have uh, 
um, two questions. Uh, one about the integrity test and what about one about the uh, thermal uh, integrity profiling. Uh, for integrity test, of course, it is, uh, it is a very common test that is done for 100% of the piles. But uh, in some cases, uh, we are asked to, to, to verify the depth or length of existing piles. Uh, and here I'm talking about uh, Dubai and UAE in general. And, uh, you know, uh, we can use the PIT test for that because it's fast and cheap. Uh, but it depends on the uh, on the uh, clear development of uh, of a toe reflection, which is usually or in most cases it's not obtained. So my question is, why this uh, the toe reflection in our geology is not is not clear in general, and is there any improvement in the test procedure that can make us uh, get uh, get better uh, uh, indication of the toe reflection? Or if we use a dynamic test, PDA analysis, does this is more, more uh, reliable to give us an indication of the length of the pipe? The second question is about the uh, thermal profiling. Uh, obviously, thermal profiling is, uh, is more uh, reliable and is very superior over the cross wall sonic. However, in, in our area, because uh, these tests are given usually in the project specifications. And, uh, and uh, we did a trial, uh, of course, you were engaged in these trials to do some kind of uh, awareness on thermal profiling. However, it's still, in, in general, it's not working well. And the application of thermal profiling, uh, although it is now a very well known and mature method worldwide, it is still not, not here. What, what do you think? can be done to, to, to make it uh, you know, more, more common or, or more be engaged in the project specifications. Thank you again for your informative presentation. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, for the pile integrity test, yes, I, I, I know that you, you, you get asked frequently to verify the pile length, especially if it's for forensic uh, purposes or they don't have records. It's an old, uh, old installation, or they want to demolish the structure and see if they can reuse the foundations. So these things come into question. It's if you and 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 the the best best uh, process is to try to have a clear code signal. And from the uh, if you have the strength of the concrete of the uh, piles to a core and test. You can correlate the, the signal strength, uh, sorry, signal uh, wave speed with the concrete strength, uh, like 4,000 meters per second. That's the yeah. standard one. If it's higher, it can be higher, lower, lower. But yeah. then if you don't have a clear toe signal, then it becomes more difficult to, to interpret. I agree with you. And, and uh, your best bet is try to get as much information as you can in the field, try different hammers. Uh, but if it's impossible to get because of noise, because of uh, being connected to other structural elements, because then you have to maybe try to find a, another method to, to, to determine that maybe you need to, to, to select one pile and maybe core it completely. Or there may be another method if you know the, uh, the, the piles enforced should be enforced. There's the L uh, light or LTE, which you can drill a, an adjacent uh, adjacent uh, hole, and then it can detect the length of reinforcement. Then uh, you can only detect the length of reinforcement. So if it's not the length of reinforcement is not all the way down, you can have a misinterpretation. That so, yeah. So and of course, if you use a, a dynamic load test, yes, of course it will. Uh, be additional information that will mobilize uh, the shaft friction if, if you can then analyze it. Uh, you will have a more um, data to analyze to give you an indication about not only the, the length, but the geotechnical capacity of the, yeah. of the But of course, it's more expensive. Um, Coming to the second half of the question about the thermal integrity 
yes, it is uh, now a mature technology. It's been around more than 10 years. It is uh, currently being uh, replaced uh, and particularly in the United States, uh, replacing most of the other testing methods. And uh, it has more reliability. I mean, the, the method is becoming, because of the uh, material, steel material cost is, is rapidly increasing because of all the, you know, inflation and logistic issues, then it, 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 it is becoming more and more attractive cost wise. That's from a cost perspective. It, it, there is a bit of a notion being adopted in the region. It could be because uh, of uh, initial investments in relation to testing equipment and relation to regulations maybe having not been updated to maybe include this as one of the methods to be adopted. But in reality, it will give, if in, in this region, I know that it's, it's uh, in, in, in Saudi, it started to be adopted in some projects, but maybe not in the UAE still. Um, also, the, it, it has to do with the training of the, of the maybe contractors or the testing agency to be able to be confident to do the test. Uh, so all these factors play a role. Well. Of course, if, if there is uh, uh, existing methods in relation to the, the codes, uh, the testing agencies know how to do the older methods, they're comfortable with it. So there is a natural kind of uh, inertia or, or uh, resistance to newer methods, which is natural, but we see it happening more and more uh, in Europe and in the United States. But uh, once, as in all technologies, it, it usually starts there and then slowly migrates within the region. And, and, I, and I think it will definitely um, increase in, in, in applications. Uh, but I think the the, the 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 consultants need to be more more educated about it, and also the the government institutions that are custodians of the codes, uh, when they see the the potential of the method, I think they will be uh, more receptive to including it in, in in the applications in their codes to utilize the power of the method to the you know the benefit of the projects and the owners. And the quality in the end, because as uh, approvers of quality, uh, it will also give them a peace of mind because this method not only sees inside, it sees outside. And in and, and this region, when everything is quick and everything, you know, they want everything yesterday, having a method that can give you results quicker will also be attractive to, to everybody, all stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, really. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Marwan likes to. Yeah, uh, 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 thank you. Thank you, uh, Engineer Ahmad. I would like to thank Dr. Hazim, uh, very informative uh, presentation. Actually, I has a, have a question, but I think he answered part of it. Uh, as you know, at the part of uh, work in the authorities and all this stuff. So um, my first part of the question, if you know any regulations or any Codes is already updated, especially with the uh, uh, last uh, the thermal uh, uh, test, which really uh, amazing and giving really detailed result um, regarding any updated code in the state or in Europe related to use that. And what do you suggest uh, to replace what the sonic test or to replace the integrity or replace uh, uh, what type of test? Uh, for, uh, for your information, now the regulation is uh, we have 100% integrity, 10% sonic, 1% static, and 5% uh, dynamic. So where we can put the thermal and how we can update or partially replace the thermal test with, with, with this percentage? Yeah. Yes, uh, in, you know, definitely there is specifications uh, in the different uh, departments of transportation, each uh, they, they have uh, adopted this in their, in their specifications, so I can communicate with you some samples of these specifications. Um, in relation to 
uh, how much, you know, it, it, it is, to me, it is a method that is, uh, does the same as the CSL, but in a, in a better way, a faster way. So I think uh, uh, a suitable way is to uh, give the, the consultant the opportunity to specify CSL or third. So it, it needs to be included as part of the mix and then maybe give the opportunity to the uh, consultant and uh, the stakeholders to make an informed decision on what is going to be better for their project or for their specific uh, you know, condition. So I think it should be, yeah, within maybe 20% similar to CSL. Uh, 10%. Yeah, it has to be pre planned. At, uh, but and in the end, it can be up to the consultant because they can go above and beyond. Like in the example we've seen here, they yeah. had 350 piles in a very short duration, and nobody wanted to take the risk of having something go wrong. So they said, let's go 100%. So it will then be up to the consultant in, really in, in, in conjunction with the owner, because in the end, this will translate into to money. So if the owner is willing to pay for the, for the 100%, he will say, yes, I want to have a peace of mind. And, uh, but I think the regulation needs to have a minimum. Uh, uh, minimum, yes. Minimum number. And then it's going to be up to the consultant and the owner to, to, to increase as they see it. But from authority point of view, we can say the sonic or what uh, we can do it instead of 10%, five thermal and 5% uh, sonic. Could could the 5% of thermal replace the five and the 5% five of uh, the sonic test? Yes, it is. Yes. Particularly for large size, uh, you know, piles, uh, deep yeah. piles, etc. It's, uh, it's all cell tests also. It's, it's, uh, it's easier to be installed and so on with information and also it gives you know data on the concrete cover which is not given by the CSL so this is a very important yeah. to know that the file concrete cover is uh, is uniform and it is integral as well so yeah and the other the other beauty is that you I mean the data when I mean, you have to visit the site once to set up the, the path. But then at the time of the recording, you don't have to visit the site and it will not be dependent on the skill yeah. of yeah. the uh, uh, the tester. The CSL, you have to have skilled uh, labor and all these things. Thermal, you just you can sit, you can sit at your desk and receive the data. And maybe yeah. if you want to 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 have more control on the, the quality. You can say in the specs, okay, the, the authority would also need to have access to the cloud in which the data is transferred. So you can yeah. have an inspection yourself, okay? Yeah. To make sure that what is collected is really uh, what is there. So yeah. it gives you a piece of mind. Yeah. Uh, last so question. Have... Yeah. The last question regarding the length, and for example, you know, sometimes you have very special projects where you, you know, your pile length 50, 60, 70 meters, something like that. So, you, did you recommend to uh, regarding the spe specification for the uh, lengthy pile? Because I think the other method will not be so successful when you exceed a certain length. So, what, yeah. what, what do you what do you recommend for that? Yeah, I mean, the term will be uh, ideal for it because in CSL, if it's not done properly, you can have uh, tube misalignment or getting stuck. We've seen this a lot, in, especially if the contractor is not uh, uh, experienced. So you, yeah. you, and if they don't use steel tubes, so you feel they lose uh, probes, they get, get stuck. And you, you see, we've seen this happen uh, in the region uh, frequently. Uh -huh. The thermal here, it's in the reinforcement case, so it will not go anywhere. It will be there, and you're going to have the, you know, the full picture within twelve hours. So the only thing is you have to pre-plan it properly because if it's a fifty or sixty meter pile, it will be in splices. So you have to take this into account into the splicing also installation, and we have the different uh, steel cages uh, being. Uh, you know, connected with each other. Also, the, the wire will need to also be spliced. 
So it can be a bit more, uh, it will take a bit more skill in the installation, but once it's installed properly, then you will have uh, peace of mind that you're going to be collecting the data that you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, really yes, appreciate it. And uh, uh, we hope that we will convene in uh, on March, actually, next uh, seminar will be on March, and it will be mostly about uh, pile group uh, performance and uh, considerations in considering the capacity and settlement of pile groups as opposed to single pile. This will be also prepared by uh, Dr. Uh, Bengt Fellinius. So we will be announcing on this uh, in the uh, DFI website, as well as on the emails. And there will be a specific flyer for this presentation. So thank you. Thank you again. And uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.